All right, hi everyone. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, uh, actually, yeah. So, in terms of norms, I'm happy to take uh, uh, some questions uh, during. Just ask them in the chat, and feel free to uh, to jump in if you're, uh, um, you know, if you want to as well. And we can just moderate it. And um, I'm also happy to, you know, if people want to show some videos too. It's nice to see a couple of people. Uh, really up to you, uh, to you all. But uh, all right, nice, uh, great. Uh, yeah, so it's not nice to see some friendly faces that uh, had a good discussion with the students. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk today a bit about uh, reinforcement learning and policy optimization in particular. So we've certainly seen a number of successes in reinforcement learning. And one of the core tools here uh, is a direct policy optimization approach. Uh, and we'd like to get a better handle on uh, what's going on, why are these methods successful, and, uh, and also more importantly, what would it take to actually uh, move things forward a bit. So uh, let's just get us all on the same page. We'll be looking at the standard MDP framework uh, where we have this uh, agent. The agent will uh, interact with an environment uh, and by taking an action, the action will impact the environment. The agent knows the state it's in, it'll receive some reward and you know this will uh, we'll repeat. Uh, and the agent has a behavioral policy or policy, which is a mapping from the state it's into the actions. Uh, let's think of it as like some kind of sequential setting where the agent will start either at some state or some distribution over states. It'll take an action, it'll see a reward, it'll see the next state, it'll take another action, it'll see a reward. Those are trajectories. The goal for the uh, agent is to maximize some notion of uh, the future reward. So here we'll just go with the standard a discounted uh, future reward. So starting from some state, say S0, uh, we're gonna try to optimize our long-term uh, future reward. It doesn't really matter if it's finite horizon. Okay, and uh, so this is our objective. So it's pretty much a straight up standard uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, let's uh, just review some of the challenges we have with reinforcement learning. Like, why is this problem hard? Okay, so... Uh, we got the problem of exploration, which like the environment may not be known, or this little robot, uh, we might not know where to go. Uh, we have this credit assignment problem, like something bad happened. Do we know if that was our immediate action that caused it or something way back in the past that uh, caused us to get the negative reward? And on top of all of this, uh, we have uh, the kind of curse of dimensionality that the states of the world uh, and the possible actions we could take could be infinite or uh, unreasonably large. You know, so this uh, this dexterous hand manipulation uh, task from OpenAI. Forget about the Rubik's cube aspect. Uh, dexterous hand manipulation is actually considered a very challenging robotics task. Here, you know, your state is the various joint angles and velocities uh, at the actuators. Uh, the, the cube configuration and the actions are going to be this vector of forces that's going to be applied to each actuator. Okay, so on top of the first two challenges, uh, we've got this uh, high dimensional uh, state space and action space causing, uh, you know, making things hard. Okay, so uh, let's set up just some background and, and uh, think about how RL is different from uh, supervised learning. Uh, and how deep RL is different from the two and, and set up some of the issues we uh, want to understand in more depth. Okay. So some background. So let's just start super simple and review uh, the classic approach to solving this problem, which is this tabular dynamic programming approach. What do we do? We're going to make this big table. Uh, the first column is going to be the possible states of the world. The second uh, column uh, is going to be possible uh, actions. And the third is going to be something we're going to use for bookkeeping, some type of algorithm, like our, say this policy iteration algorithm. Okay, so what we're going to put in first, the, the third column is, you know, start with some policy. In the third co column, we're going to kind of compute like this one step look ahead value, which is uh, at some state S, we're going to take action A, then we compute uh, our future reward after that, uh, including the immediate reward. Okay, so this is this a state action value, okay, and it's like a one step look ahead when we do action A. Uh, suppose we just magically could compute this for every uh, row in this uh, infinitely long third column. If we could do that, 
then what we're going to do is we're going to update our policy to be greedy with respect to this. Uh, so this is like an improvement step. Uh, it turns out you can show this improvement step uh, will make things better, and we iterate. And, and it actually, this algorithm will converge pretty quickly globally. Okay, uh, but of course, the problem is that uh, this table, uh, you know, there's multiple problems, but uh, the most glaring one here uh, is that this table is infinitely big, and you know, how do we deal with this? Uh, with this? Uh, with the fact that it's infinitely big. And the idea from the RL and machine learning side is, um, you know, try to generalize rather than kind of querying every entry in this table, uh, we're gonna do some kind of sampling or supervised learning approach, uh, maybe with deep learning, uh, because that seems very good at generalization to try to uh, find an optimal policy, right? And this was, uh, kind of the, the big push for deep RL because uh, we were taking this uh, really good generalization power we had, uh, dumping it into the, the setting of uh, RL. Uh, is this a new idea? Well, you know, not really. Like you go back to the 90s, this was this book by uh, uh, John Ciclickless and Dmitry Botsekas where they give uh, one of the first analyses of uh, kind of a function approximation uh, where you know, they were looking at worst case error, so it's very pessimistic, but the motivation was what happens if we had some kind of universal function approximators given say by neural networks, uh, when we plug into these dynamic uh, programming approaches. So it's kind of an old idea, but it's, it, you know, the statistical aspects of the fact that we're generalizing quite well has had a major influence uh, in practice and uh, and we're trying to understand, uh, not only understand how well these things, uh, why they're working, but also uh, get them to work better. Okay, so so uh, one of the things that uh, has been working quite well uh, are these policy gradient methods. Rather than this dynamic programming approach, what we're gonna do is uh, just write down the function we wanna optimize, do gradient descent on it. Okay, so uh, we aren't really directly doing this um, big, tabular dynamic pro programming approach. This seems to work extremely well, uh, maybe not too surprising uh, uh, based on what we've seen in other areas of machine learning. So, uh, but it's worthwhile to ask like, why are these methods good? Because there, there really are some differences here. Uh, well, one of them uh, is, is that these approaches, it's very easy to handle these like large state and action spaces. You just directly parameterize your behavioral policy, uh, say with some big neural network, uh, and uh, uh, so that's easy to come up with a, a function class. Uh, it's also easy to compute these gradients through simulation-based methods. So you don't really need to know the model, uh, just using like this like likelihood ratio method. Uh, you can just do rollouts in the world and you can get unbiased estimates of the gradient. So as long as you can differentiate your policy uh, and as long as you can act in the world by doing rollouts, you can get unbiased estimates of gradients. It's very easy to do, uh, makes it very easy to like, uh, you know, code these things up and run it. Okay. And the, the biggest reason that uh, I think these uh, are popular and they work very well is, you know, we know in machine learning, we should not underestimate trying to directly optimize the, the thing we care about doing. Right? There's lots of model base and other things, but uh, one thing that's uh, clearly a very important ingredient is just write down what we want to optimize and spend a lot of time uh, in compute cycles trying to do that well. Uh, and this definitely fits uh, in line with that principle. Okay, but uh, one concern here is the optimizations landscape of uh, RL uh, really looks very different from supervised learning. So in supervised learning, to a large extent, we don't care that much about non-convexity. Like, yeah, these uh, the landscape of these deep nets are non-convex, but we run SGD, it seems to work. We have various initialization tricks. Uh, we don't believe saddle points are a problem. You kind of shake the system. It seems like, uh, it, it seems like you find uh, uh, like a good classifier. But the, the situation in reinforcement learning is very, very different because uh, we don't have landscapes that look like this. So, so these um, flat gradients are a very real concern in reinforcement learning, uh, where you can actually have uh, regions that, uh, you know, they have exponentially small gradients and even worse, uh, like all higher orders of the gradients are gonna be flat. So, so basically uh, 
the kind of standard RL problem or many of them do not at all look like this picture where you can kind of shake the system and you'll magically uh, improve. Why? Because uh, you know this is basically this problem of exploration. So consider this problem where two actions take you to the left, one takes you to the right. This is an example from Sebastian Thrun's thesis. Uh, and if we act randomly starting in L0, it's a random walk with drift going backwards. So it's like exponential time uh, for us to ever see a reward if the reward's at the rightmost state. Okay, And uh, that's a sampling issue. Uh, but suppose we could get exact gradients and exact like higher order gradients. Okay, This problem has flat gradients for very high orders. Okay, So going up to like uh, almost order S, the, gradi the gradients are exponentially flat. So this isn't like this nice picture. You can kind of add a little bit of noise and things improve. Uh, the actual landscape is uh, very, very uh, poor. Okay. And, uh, and, and this is an issue even when you have exact gradients. Obviously, for sampling reasons, uh, you are doomed too. But even with exact gradients, uh, the shape of the surface is very bad. Okay. So, so there's some real differences here between uh, RL and supervised learning. And what we're going to uh, focus on is uh, try to get a handle on what's uh, going on here, because uh, you know, having said this, uh, we also kind of know these methods work very well. So, so what's going on? And so we, so we not only like to understand what's going on here, but uh, get some insights as to how we can potentially improve these methods uh, based on various uh, possible shortcomings. Okay, so. Uh, the talk's really going to be looking at two parts, looking at uh, global convergence of these methods uh, and issues with regards to generalization and approximation. Okay, because uh, the landscape here really is non-convex, but it's non-convex in a way that uh, actually gives us, you know, we should pause a bit and actually see uh, what's going on because we should not expect them to work uh, for the reasons I just uh, mentioned. Okay, so, so the first part is really going to be looking at uh, forget about deep nets. Let's make life easy. Let's assume we have a small state space and we're getting exact gradients. See, if we can't even figure this out, you know, th things are super bad. Okay, so, so we want to start like super simple, see what's going on with the basics. Uh, and that part's really going to be getting us a better handle on curvature and non convexity. Okay, once that's done, obviously we don't want to solve small problems, but we want to use that understanding to help us with. Uh, larger problems. So then we'll move to uh, the large state space case where the issues we'll see are about how we deal with generalization and distribution shift. Okay. And I'll, I'll discuss why this notion of uh, transfer learning is uh, actually quite relevant in this context and uh, mention some points as to why we care, uh, like why these methods are quite successful because uh, say compared to this tabular uh, approach where we maybe do function approximation with this big table. Okay, so, uh, so let's just jump in and we're going to start with uh, the case of uh, small state spaces. Okay, in this case, you know, if we knew the model, uh, we know how to solve the problem. We just do this tabular approach or write down a linear program. Okay, so uh, let's also think about uh, a, a policy class in this case, which is the, 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 the type of policy class we would use uh, in practice. So uh, typically we don't like using projections. Uh, like you could just write down a policy, uh, you know, the probability of a coin as P, uh, but the problem is now you have to deal with projections because you know your probabilities have to sum to one. And, and the, uh, what we typically do is either do some proximal method to project back on the simplex. But what that often amounts to is just parameterizing the simplex uh, with the softmax parameterization. So we say the probability of taking action A given S is uh, this particular form. So, we, so what's nice about this uh, parameterization is uh, we can represent every st uh, stationary policy and we can take derivatives. Okay, so we don't have to worry about projections. So in this sense, it's like a complete policy parameterization. It clearly contains the optimal policy. It contains uh, all policy, all stationary policies. Okay. Uh, and now we kind of want to start jumping in and get a handle of, of what happens when we run a gradient descent on this policy class, because it contains the optimal policy. Uh, granted, it's out of infinity. Uh, and it contains uh, 
all the policies. Okay, and uh, so what we're interested in is this objective function, which we want to find a good uh, set of parameters which maximizes our long-term value, uh, but it's a non-convex optimization problem. Okay, so what's going to happen? Okay, and do we have global convergence? And you know, if things start breaking here, uh, we want to understand why, because if you, we aren't solving simple problems, uh, this seems like it's not going to bode well for more complicated problems. Okay, but we're going to see that uh, the issues we run into are very revealing for how we want to handle the more complicated problems. Okay, so the first, uh, you know, the most basic thing is, uh, you know, in this first part, let's even forget about sampling at all. Let's uh, assume we can get exact gradients. This first part of the talk, we're going to assume um, we can get grad v pi theta of s zero with some modification of it exactly. Okay, and the first question is: Let's just straight up run vanilla gradient descent. Will it even converge to the right answer in the limit? Okay, because you know there's this flat gradient issue. But let's forget about rates. Uh, will it even converge? Okay, it turns out that uh, we actually need uh, uh, one modification on this. Rather than directly doing uh, gradient descent on the starting state, we're going to do gradient descent on some distribution that has support on all of the states. Okay, so this distribution mu is uh, some starting state distribution. Okay, so uh, it's going to have a little bit of mass on all of the states. Okay, so uh, suppose we did just straight up vanilla gradient descent with, uh, with an oracle that gives us exact gradients. Okay, then uh, what you can actually show is we will get a global convergence in the limit. So asymptotically, uh, for every state, you will converge to the optimal policy and you'll get op the optimal value. Uh, and this is uh, definitely asymptotic. Uh, because, um, you know, it, technically that previous example doesn't apply because we've got uh, uh, support everywhere because sometimes you might start near that rightmost state because uh, we're assuming mu has full support. Okay, but uh, a couple of points worth mentioning. So, uh, so one, it's nice. Yes, it's non-convex, but we get global uh, convergence. The proof for this is um, it's pretty delicate because it's asymptotic. Part of the issues are... Um, you know, since we're, we're converging, we might be converging to a deterministic policy that's really out at infinity. Uh, the bigger problem here is that the rate is uh, truly could be exponentially slow in the number of states. Uh, and this is really due to the softmax having flat gradients. So even if we somehow start with a measure, the starting mu is spread out everywhere, then you're not going to have this flat gradient problem. But even then you can come up with cases where uh, this procedure would be very, very slow because basically this way we parameterize the simplex leads to very flat gradients. Because uh, if you go to some, some corner, your gradients are going to become very slow and you might have to escape it. And it just takes you a very, uh, it'll take you a very long time to kind of turn around and, and move away from corners. Okay, so, but at the very least asymptotically, uh, we converge. Okay, but it, it kind of makes sense that there's curvature problems uh, because of our parameterization. Okay, so the, so the next obvious thing uh, to think about is like, well, what if we try some kind of regularization to, you know, bias ourselves from getting these flat gradients? Because, you know, if your policy is near to deterministic, um, you're going to get super flat gradients. Maybe you could just push yourself away from the simplex a little. Uh, not too far because we want to get to the corners, but just a little so our gradients don't collapse. So how do we do this? Well, the simplest thing is to do some kind of log barrier based penalty. Okay, so, so now let's consider a regularization penalty where rather than uh, directly doing gradient descent on the spread out measure, let's add in a penalty uh, which will push us away from getting deterministic uh, policies. Okay, so uh, just take like the average uh, log probability. So uh, this is going to keep your, your uh, policy from becoming too deterministic. And again, you know, there's like a usual 
a trade-off here. You don't want lambda too big because then you're messing up the answer, but the hope is uh, you know, this is going to help you. And it does. So this is a curvature issue. If you put in this log barrier regularization, again, in this simple tabular case, getting exact gradients. Uh, in this case, uh, we will actually get a, a polynomial convergence rate in the number of states, the actions, and the horizon. So I'm going to use h to be 1 over 1 minus gamma, which you can effectively think of it as the effective horizon. That's where, you know, that's where most of the impact of your reward is coming from in this discounted setting. So kind of polynomial and all the relevant quantities, you run this regularized uh, procedure, you have to set lambda as a function of epsilon uh, because we care about our value. Uh, we will get to the right answer uh, at a reasonable-ish rate. Um, so, so we get convergence and we've handled this, uh, this curvature issue with, uh, with a log barrier. So again, like um, uh, it's non-convex, but uh, you can prove it converges globally. Uh, this proof is actually uh, re revealing. Uh, so, you know, so the proof here is uh, in quotes clean. Um, well, the other one's revealing too, but it's like it's an analysis. Uh, it's like pages of analysis. Whereas this one, I think, seeing what's going on will help you understand the problem. Uh, and what what's going on is this log barrier plus this uniform is helping us with kind of this exploration issue and uh, conditioning issues. Um, I guess I wrote the proof is clean for that step. Okay, so one uh, interesting point to note is this log barrier function, it's actually the same as a KL regularizer. Uh, so it's KL to the uniform distribution and it's different from the entropy regularization that people use in practice. So the entropy, uh, you know, while is a reasonable heuristic, it, it seems too weak uh, to get uh, global convergence at a polynomial rate in S and A. Uh, it, it will eventually converge, uh, but if you want polynomial factors in S and A, uh, it does seem to be too weak to get um, this type of uh, convergence. So it is a cur curious that this entropy-based convergence uh, is uh, is somehow not strong enough because I, I think you will, um, it, it can collapse pretty easily with the entropy penalty. Whereas this one really is KL and KL uh, against uniform, like you never want to say one log zero with KL basically. Whereas with entropy, uh, you can be deterministic and still have finite entropy. Okay, so uh, now we're getting somewhere. We see, uh, we're thinking a bit about curvature, we're thinking about a measure to, to improve things. Uh, but there's one more uh, approach we, uh, we can try, which is how about we just warp the way uh, we move with a preconditioner to try to move faster near the boundaries of the simplex. Okay, so this is this uh, natural uh, policy gradient uh, idea. And, you know, like Roger uh, with you guys has done uh, a ton of work looking at uh, these sort of methods with deep learning. Uh, the, in the space of uh, policy gradient methods, it's a little more subtle because uh, our policy is actually a family of dis probability di distributions because for every state we have a distribution of our actions. Uh, but the idea is kind of similar in spur to these other methods where we parameterize our simplex. We'd like to move faster near these corners because that's where our gradients are small. Uh, can we just somehow stretch the geometry out so we can move quickly uh, when things become flat. Okay. And the idea now is uh, we're going to consider a weighted Fisher metric. So this is going to be, uh, so for every state we have a, a Fisher matrix, which is, uh, um, you know, this grad log pi, grad log pi transpose. And then we're going to take this expected Fisher matrix over the states and actually uh, over the states we tend to visit under the current distribution. So this is like, um, you know, as some people showed later on, like Drew Bagno, this is actually the Fisher matrix of the trajectories you follow. Okay, uh, but uh, it's, so it's a little subtle here, but it's kind of an, a natural guess as something to try. Okay, and, uh, and now what you would do is just, let's run gradient descent with this preconditioner because uh, it'll try to stretch things out to maybe handle this curvature issue uh, a little more cleanly. Okay, and, most practical variants are trying to do something like this. So TRPO, it's exactly the same as 
uh, as this method to first order because the trust region really is uh, a Fisher penalty. And, uh, and PPO uh, has a lot of similarities uh, to how we stretch things out as well. Okay, so again, before we move to more complicated things, let's still stick with this simple tabular case and try to see what goes on. Okay, because, uh, uh, so again, we're in this case of uh, the softmax policy class. Uh, so it's this policy class that looks like this. Uh, we're gonna follow this update rule, uh, but what's pretty neat about this case is uh, our update rule uh, literally looks like a soft policy iteration uh, update rule. So at the beginning, we when we looked at this tabular approach, uh, we, uh, we reminded ourselves what this policy iteration algorithm was, where the next policy is greedy with respect to this Q function. Okay, so for this particular case, uh, this algorithm is like a soft policy iteration update, where uh, rather than going to the, uh, the greedy action, you're increasing the probability of actions in proportional to e to those Q values. So for like an infinite setting with a learning rate, you're going to recover the, uh, the policy iteration algorithm, at least for one step. Uh, but this is a more uh, incremental algorithm. So it's kind of slowly moving, okay? And, uh, and now we wanna know what happens, but it's kind of interesting that in this case, we get a very natural looking uh, algorithm. Okay, so uh, the question now is like, what happens for this non-convex update rule? And we might hope that something good happens because this really looks like, uh, you know, just a softer version of, this classic algorithm, okay? And again, remember our motivation isn't to solve the tabular case. If we want to do that, just write down an LP. But understanding what's going on for this method, we'll see uh, why it'll help us once we go to the large state space case. Okay, so there's natural gradient, you know, we've warped the state space. Uh, what's kind of neat here is there's kind of no dependence on the starting distribution, right? Because before we had this gradient of S0, in there. Here, uh, the way you've done this preconditioning, it actually somehow emphasizes all of the states in a similar manner. Okay, so let's look at our convergence rate. So it's a uh, super clean uh, convergence rate. Uh, set the learning rate appropriately. Uh, for every, uh, I guess I should write uh, the row here. Let's call this S. Call this state S. So this is for all states S. Uh, you're gonna be converging to the optimal policy at uh, that state at a rate of one over T. It's, it's very clean. And there's a couple of striking things that you might immediately notice here. Uh, so the first that's pretty nice is the number of iterations this algorithm takes. It has no dependence on uh, the number of states, the number of actions or the starting measure. Like before we needed to start with a thing spread out to handle this exploration issue here, you know, if you got exact gradients, uh, you kind of warp the space that it doesn't matter how, you know, the, the way you start because it just rescales everything to travel very quickly. Uh, so this is pretty, uh, this is pretty nice. Another thing from the optimization standpoint, uh, this is a fast rate. So from, from, you know, when we put our optimization uh, hats on, whenever you see a rate of one over T, this is pretty nice because it's uh, usually faster. It's faster than the one over root T rates that we often get uh, with many algorithms. Okay, and uh, so we bypassed a lot of things. Uh, the idea of this approach uh, actually is, is really like a mirror descent approach in disguise. I won't have time to get into that, but uh, that is surprising because it's like a, a non-convex analysis. Uh, I mean, it's a non-convex problem. But when you look at how we're analyzing things, it actually looks like an expert style uh, of algorithm. And in fact, uh, it was analyzed in this earlier work uh, as an expert's algorithm in a different setting. Um, but it turns out those techniques can be used here. Uh, so now we've kind of uh, understood that uh, we have some tools to understand how to think about uh, these flat gradients that's having this distribution view. And we understand uh, this curvature issue where we can say, use these uh, natural gradients, use this Fisher metric to warp, uh, to warp this space. So, so now at least we know that with exact gradients and a tabular case will converge, but we can converge very quickly uh, with, this, with this preconditioner with no dependence on S and A. 
Okay, so now we can start thinking about what happens uh, when you sample gradients or you have approximations, because uh, now we're at least we're in this game where we don't have explicit dependencies on S and A. So maybe we could try to do some kind of supervised learning in this mix and, uh, or you know, use some rich policy parameterization and, uh, and, maybe, uh, and maybe we could start understanding you know, generalization and dealing with the large state space case. So are there, are there a couple of quick questions here? I can take maybe uh, one for uh, uh, if we have one. If not, I'd, I will move on. So uh, there, are a few in the, there are a few in the chat. I can read them out loud. Uh, of course, the authors, if they would like to, can unmute and ask them themselves. But I, I see a question, is it expensive to use natural policy gradient? Is, or, uh, and it, is it a second order method? Okay, so. That's the question. Yeah, okay, so uh, so in practice, uh, in some of these settings like TRPO, you actually burn a fair bit of compute trying to uh, invert a big matrix with conjugate gradient. Uh, so RL is one of these settings where it's not like I was talking with some students before, it's not like these SGD settings where you just use mini batching. You actually gather quite a lot of data in phases and try to squeeze a lot, squeeze a lot out of what you want to do in each phase. So, uh, so it's costly. Uh, but TRPO does that, and you actually uh, really try to burn your compute, getting a lot of data, and do some kind of uh, uh, some kind of preconditioning method. Uh, it's not actually second order. You might think of it as quasi Newton, but uh, at the end of the day, the problem with second order for these sort of things, like it really is an LP under the hood. So it's not clear what exactly a Hessian even means here. Uh, but you could view this as some kind of uh, quasi Newton-ish method. Um, but actually, second order uh, does not seem uh, does not seem the right way to, to do this. Okay, so let's uh, uh, quickly take stock and, and uh, uh, look at some related work and how to think about this measure mu. Uh, then jump into the question of generalization. So uh, I have videos here. Okay, I was going to switch, uh, but in the interest of time. I'll just explain uh, the issues. So uh, this is a bit of an interlude just to try to understand, uh, like, do we really need this measure mu? Uh, so, you know, these are some major code tasks. If you train your system to like hop, this is a hopper or a runner. If you train it to hop from the given starting state, it'll do that. But if you just give this thing a force and knock it over into some other configuration, it can't get back up. Right? Like it's very sensitive to uh, the distribution it's trained on. And if you put it in other configurations, it will not work uh, oftentimes. Okay, so in practice, what people do is they often train in diverse sets of conditions uh, so it's robust in practice. Uh, and you can again view this as an issue of exploration slash coverage. Okay, you can uh, uh, look at this paper or there's some videos associated with it. Uh, they're they're kind of cute. You're, this hopper is running, you give it a force, it falls over, it knows how to get up in one position, it can't do that again. And, and this is actually what they do in many real settings. So like, this uh, uh, demo, this Rubik's Cube thing. So this is a video where they had a giraffe pushing it, but the way they trained it is they didn't just train it from one starting configuration. They, they kind of chose all kinds of different configuration physics parameters. They call this domain randomization, but it's basically starting a system in lots of diff different configurations uh, to, try to, be, uh, to try to be robust. So this issue of somehow uh, robustness is closely related to this coverage issue. Uh, and it is actually uh, quite widely used uh, in practice that you obviously need tricks to get around uh, not just flat gradients, but to also deal with like, um, you know, robustness issues. Okay, so uh, the questions we're going to be thinking about uh, for the function approximation case is like, how do we think about generalization now when we have a lot of states? And how do we think about this measure mu that at least for the KL regularization, uh, is relevant. For natural gradient, we didn't need it, but obviously, you know, if we were in that chain case, we, there was no way with a sample based method we'd ever get in, helpful, uh, we'd ever get useful information. Okay, so, um, you know, there's definitely a, a, a fair a, a bit of related work uh, going back to uh, worst case guarantees for dynamic programming. The difficulty there is it's very hard to get to say much about generalization when we 
are doing this, um, this tabular approach with a function approximator. All the guarantees uh, look very worst case in a way, um, they don't look like supervised learning guarantees where we have generalization. Uh, this idea of using a measure was actually present in CPI. That was the, uh, the first kind of idea of uh, say, when we optimize a different objective function, uh, we could um, kind of generalize and I'll, I'll come back to the spirit of those results. Uh, in terms of optimization, the things I mentioned, uh, these, these results are largely, uh, largely new. I, I mentioned the sort of roots in this uh, experts-based analysis, but actually looking specific gradient descent, uh, we don't, we haven't really had uh, a clear analysis for this non-convex pr program. Uh, but the point we're going to uh, jump to now is, uh, in the remaining time, I'm going to highlight how to think about the large state space case, because this is what we care about. Like we care about doing RL, uh, not on these simple maze tasks. We want to do this on robotics, uh, you know, healthcare data with your policies, uh, uh, interacting with the world, uh, games, uh, many high dimensional problems. Uh, and we have to deal with uh, approximation and generalization. Uh, but we started with this soft packs policy class uh, and most policies classes we use are of this form. There's e, you know, the the log of a function. Right? So the soft max policy class, this function F is just, um, is just this tabular parameterization. Okay, but, uh, a log linear parameterization is we have some features. If we have some features, uh, we could say this F is linear in these features. And another uh, natural policy uh, class is a neural policy class where this function F is a neural network. Okay, so now we can just revisit what we just did with uh, changing this function F to say be log linear. I spend most of the time on log linear. You can look at the paper for the neural policy class, but this already captures much of the, the intuition. Okay, so, uh, so again, we're looking at these policy classes, which e to the f that's parameterized in some way. And uh, let's look at the log linear class. This one's interesting because maybe like we don't even contain the optimal policy, right? So, so this is a setting where we have some feature mapping, uh, where the feature mapping is an r to the d. We typically want a case where this dimension is much smaller than the number of states and actions, because that's what's going to allow us handle it. Uh, that's what's going to allow us to handle the cursive dimensionality. So let's go ahead and see what happens with this, uh, this natural gradient update rule. This is natural policy gradient, because that's the one that gives us the dimension free convergence rate. Let's see what will happen if we try to do something like that here, uh, say with a sample based approach to get the gradient. Okay, because you know, the hope now is like, look, we've understood what's going on in one case, uh, maybe um, uh, maybe we can uh, now understand what happens with regards to generalization. Okay, let me know if my slides don't advance. Like occasionally it just sort of drops out and I'm stuck, but uh, it seems to be advancing. Okay, so, uh, so what is this update rule for this uh, policy class now? So we're literally gonna look at exactly the same update rule, uh, but with a different policy class. Okay, and uh, it turns out it actually has a very simple uh, uh, form, just like it did for the tabular case, uh, where what, what you're going to do is, you know, before, what did the update rule look like? It looked like, take your policy, multiply it by e to the q, like the soft policy uh, update rule. Well, here it's going to look like an approximate soft policy update rule. Okay, so, so this update rule is completely equivalent to the following regression-based strategy that you fit the current Q value with your features. Okay, so compute this, the arg min of this regression problem. Uh, now we're gonna say D is some kind of, uh, you know, it's an on policy distribution. So mu is gonna be something with coverage. Suppose we had an Oracle that uh, started the system in different configurations and it's gonna start at a state action pair. Okay, then you're gonna solve this regression. You're gonna gather a bunch of data, solve this regression problem. Okay, and you could actually solve this with samples rather than exact. Okay, so you get samples, do the regression. You're regressing phi to the Qs. Now, even though we're doing this gradient update rule, it's equivalent to something that just looks like regression. Okay, why? Because if you look at this thing, you're solving a linear system with this preconditioner, and it just magically ends up looking like this update rule where 
uh, where you know if you're doing it exactly, you would find the best fit Q uh, with your features, and then you're going to update your policies by being uh, e to your Q hat, because you could think of this thing as like your Q hat, which is your best approximation to Q with the features you've got. Okay, so so it really is a clean update rule. Uh, it's this kind of soft way of doing policy iteration. And again, if we made eta infinity, we would jump to the greedy update rule, but this is far more incremental. And the reason this incremental approach is nice is because we're actually doing hill climbing. If we took a step that's too big, we might not get improvement due to errors, but here provided, um, you know, our statistical error when we do this regression isn't too big and eta small, we will be doing hill climbing. Okay, so, uh, so now let's look at a performance guarantee when rather than doing uh, exact updates, consider doing, you know, we're going to use samples here. And in particular, that means we're going to have hats on top of this. Is it, because it turns out if you did the exact update rule uh, and if there is no approximation error, then uh, you're done by the same analysis. Okay, but here we can now say, can we understand what happens if we literally just do this update rule, uh, which is actually one of the most common things people do uh, even in practice, not just uh, an analysis idea, because it is basically TRPO. Uh, we'd like to understand what happens. Okay, And what's nice here is we've got uh, kind of a, a supervised learning subproblem uh, inside this because this is regression. Okay, So now the question would be like, look, if we're generalizing here in some sense, are we actually able to uh, to do RL well, meaning like handle the cursor dimensionality? So the first uh, uh, theorem here is going to be uh, when we make a realizability assumption, uh, which is a stronger assumption, but we can see that uh, we can do RL. Sean, quick question. Just want to verify that phi is given to you in this setting right know. now? Uh, yeah, so, so in the neural case, uh, it isn't known. You just know the function class. But in this case, uh, we definitely know uh, uh, phi. And we're taking the gradient of you know, this objective function, uh, knowing phi. And that's equivalent to this. So we know phi. Equivalent way to do this is rather than solve this linear system, we do the regression, which is also solving the linear system. So we fit phi to q's or Q hats if we have a sample data and we apply this update rule. So this is like straight up like regression with known features, but we're using the result of this regression to incrementally update the policy. So it's like a soft update rule. Okay, so uh, the simplest thing to do now is let's suppose for a moment, uh, things were realizable that for every Q function, uh, um, it lives in the span of these features. This is a strong assumption, uh, but let's at least handle this case first. Okay, so this is like a regression model is correct. Okay, so what's interesting here is, you know, while we're using this log linear policy class, this assumption is about how phi relates to the values. So there is this kind of connection between, you know, policy optimization and value-based assumptions. And this assumption is, let's go ahead and just make a value-based assumption that these features, uh, you know, will accurately uh, approximate Q, well, perfectly approximate Q. But again, we're doing this gradient-based method. Okay, now let's suppose uh, when we do our supervised learning, when we do a regression, epsilon stat is our statistical error. Okay, so this is, uh, we gather a bunch of data, uh, we do a regression, suppose uh, epsilon stat is a statistical error, but we know that our statistical error is gonna be uh, about one over root N or one over, uh, uh, one over n, depending on which type of theory you use. So, so this thing will really go to zero, zero as we get more samples. Right? So there's nothing magical about epsilon stat here. It's just straight up um, converging to the best answer. It's a convex problem. That'll happen at a rate of one over root n, where n is the number of samples. Okay. And the last assumption we'll make, uh, we know we'll need something like this, is a coverage-based assumption because uh, we can't expect this thing to work if we just started at a given starting state because you're going to have this flat gradient problem. But let's suppose our starting distribution uh, doesn't hit every possible uh, state in action, but let's suppose that uh, you know the starting distribution 
has coverage over the covariance matrix of the features. Okay, so this is a conditioning issue. So uh, when we start the system, it at least is pushing the phi's in all the different directions. Okay, and these are kind of the the, the kind of uh, this is kind of the best case scenario that uh, we don't have coverage over all S A pairs, but at least we have coverage over the features, uh, and uh, we're going to assume it's realizable, and our regressions are epsilon stat uh, accurate. Okay, so so now, what's the behavior of um, this method? Okay, and, and this really is a sample based approach, and this is a real algorithm. Right? This is literally just exactly this natural gradient algorithm, but with connections to regression. Okay, and uh, we get a global convergence uh, guarantee that uh, where we do converge to the, the optimal answer at a reasonable rate. Okay, so again, A is the number of actions, H is our horizon, and let's assume we have a norm constraint when we do our regressions. Okay, so uh, this term is our optimization error. It's one over t rather one over root t rather than one over t. Uh, it just seems like it, it's hard to get the one over t rate once you have uh, errors in the mix. But this is like the usual rate of convergence if you're doing SGD. Okay, so that's just straight up optimization error. And this part is the contribution of statistical error. What's very nice is these are all polynomial in pretty reasonable quantities because epsilon stat is going to zero as you draw more samples. Uh, you have a condition number dependence here, but this condition number morally is really, uh, it's really a dimension dependent quantity as opposed to dependence over the number of states and actions. Okay, uh, but we were using the realizability assumption, but at least shows that under this assumption, we can handle the curse of dimensionality. We get a global convergence guarantee and the two things we need are, uh, you know, coverage over features. That's pretty reasonable. Uh, we're kind of punting on exploration for now and uh, regression to work. But let's take a step back in the remaining 10 minutes and just try to ask uh, what happens when we don't have this uh, realizability assumption? Because in supervised learning, uh, it seems to work pretty well, even if our models are misspecified. Okay, so here we aren't explicitly talking about a model of the world, but we are asking these Q functions to be perfectly approximated by the phi's. Okay, and, and now uh, what happens if maybe this doesn't hold? Like, because we're just gonna use some features or some neural net and uh, we hope it approximates it well, but uh, you know, there's, there's likely gonna be some error somewhere due to approximation error. Okay, so let's just revisit uh, the sample based procedure and then give the guarantee because uh, what's interesting now is uh, the ways in which approximation error and estimation error appear in the RL setting, uh, it's actually quite subtle and different from how we think about things in supervised learning. Okay, so let's just make a definition. Uh, L is this loss function we're minimizing. Uh, w here is the parameter. Okay. Theta is gonna be our target function here. Okay, nu is gonna be the measure we use in our uh, optimization. Okay, so that's like the on, that's how we're getting our samples, right? So uh, when we're doing the natural gradient, we collect our samples, we're minimizing this thing under a distribution nu. Okay, and, and in this notation, what the natural gradient update is, is uh, when we do samples is we're gonna gather some data, minimize L hat, uh, but the point now, this D is like an on policy distribution. You know, theta is the current function. So we're going to gather some data, uh, minimize this function. Uh, and we know uh, if it's not realizable, the minimum possible error of L might not be zero. Okay. So, uh, but the algorithm in this context is we're minimizing this sample based approximation where you want to pay attention to what the measure is here because that's how we're gathering our samples. Okay, we do that and we do our update rule. Okay, so this is just the same thing we did before, but with notation of L's because L's are the, um, uh, that's kind of the relevant notion of, uh, of supervised learning here because implicitly this update rule is doing a regression. And this last, last theorem has assumed that 
uh, our features are good to well up. There's basically no approximation error is what our last theorem said. Okay, so, so now what's the effect when we have approximation error? Okay, and this is where uh, things like distribution shift shows up. Okay, so now we're gonna make two assumptions. The first one is just uh, statistically error because we know that uh, you know, D of T is how we gather our data. Uh, we know every round uh, we can make RL close to the best in class. So W star is best in class. Okay, we know epsilon stat will go to zero because as you get more data, you're gonna be best in class. So think of epsilon stat as your, your best in class error. Okay, epsilon approx isn't gonna be zero under this distribution. This is your fitting distribution if your model isn't well specified. Okay, but the subtle point here is that this epsilon approx, that's defined with respect to uh, the approximation error under your current fitting distribution. Okay, uh, and this assumption is the same as before. Okay, so this epsilon is prox is under the fitting distribution uh, at iteration t. And if we think about RL conceptually, um, you know, we're trying to, you know, we keep updating our policies and these distributions keep changing. Uh, and the concern is like, just because we have low approximation error under a current distribution, is that good enough to do well under a different distribution? Okay, and uh, the point is it's not, uh, that you get a pretty, you know, you get a worst case amplification effect, uh, so, so let's look at the theorem and interpret it, and then I'll wrap up. Okay, so this is a contribution from statistical error. This is a contribution from approximation error, uh, where approximation error is defined with respect to the, uh, how you're currently fitting things in each iteration. Uh, now we've got three terms. We have optimization error. Uh, great, that looks good. We've got a statistical error. This looks good because epsilon stat will go to zero as you get more samples. Like as you get more samples, you'll converge to being best in class. Okay, this thing <clears throat> has this amplification effect here. So this is a worst case density ratio between, uh, okay, so I should define D star here. So D star, is uh, say the state action distribution of any comparator policy pi star. So suppose you wanna do, uh, it doesn't have to be optimal. Suppose we wanna do as good as some uh, policy pi star. Okay, uh, what this, you know, what's really going on here is we need our approximation error to be small under pi stars measure. Okay, so this worst case density ratio here is literally just a transfer learning factor of saying, you know, we have some approximation error under a fitting distribution. What actually matters is our approximation error under the comparators distribution, which is pi star. So if we want to have a uh, value which is higher than say V star, but think of V star as not necessarily the optimum policy, just any other policy, fix it. We need the approximation error to be small under a different distribution, okay? And, and that's really a distribution uh, shift notion. Uh, you know, if it's realizable, obviously that's zero, uh, but what's really going on here with these policy gradient methods, uh, which, this is basically the strongest class of guarantees we have uh, in RL when we aren't making uh, well-specified assumptions. Uh, the reason this is a strong guarantee is it basically says, if we can uh, transfer to our comparator's measure, which is fixed, uh, then we're gonna do well. Okay. And, and this, this makes some sense. So hopefully our features will allow us to have low uh, approximation error under a shifted distribution. Uh, and this is definitely weaker than uh, realizability because uh, 
it's a, you know, in, in the paper, we give a more general notion without these infinity ratios, but it's much weaker than realizability because realizability is point-wise, everything's good. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, talking to like Shai about this uh, and, and Dan earlier, we don't have a good way uh, to formalize when this is better than some of these worst case bounds. Like uh, this is an active uh, area, of, area of research of understanding uh, when transfer learning is okay. Okay, so uh, you know, let, let me just take some questions about this uh, after and wrap things up uh, because this last issue is a bit delicate, but uh, it is pretty interesting that um, you know that uh, three classic notions of you know optimization error, statistical error, and approximation error. It looks very different in the RL context, and the the approximation error is really uh, rearing its head through an issue of transfer learning. Okay, so uh, we're getting a handle on how to think about these policy gradient based approaches. Uh, and the, the main point is the reason they're so effective is that uh, their, you know, the guarantee for their approximation error, while it looks nasty because it's a transfer learning um, notion, it's, it's a much milder condition than what we need for these uh, previous dynamic programming based approaches because we only need transfer learning to work under against one fixed comparator distribution. There's a lot of conceptually uh, important points for uh, future work. So we're sidestepping this issue of exploration by assuming we have a good coverage distribution mu. Okay, and we, we'd really like to learn this in the, uh, in the mix. Okay, and and we're, uh, you know, various people are thinking about uh, ways to mix local search with exploration with various bonuses and lots of other heuristics. And, uh, you know, and the other point is, look, the theory of like generalization in RL is different from, from supervised learning. And at a bare minimum, uh, the best we have is we need to be able to say something about transfer learning uh, to work for when uh, RL is going, going to work. Obviously, if we make much stronger modeling assumptions, uh, we could get guarantees theoretically. The problem is those algorithms tend to be very brittle. Uh, and the, this, uh, these gradient methods, uh, they seem to be the most robust approach we have to dealing with model misspecification. But even there, to say anything about how we compare to you know, some comparator, we do need some restrictions uh, where transfer learning has to work. And in many settings, let's be clear, like transfer learning works much better uh, in practice than uh, the worst case theory uh, suggests. We just don't really have a clean way of understanding when that works. And uh, you know, this has worked with a lot of really uh, great colleagues. So uh, Alec, I've been working on this stuff for a while, and then Jason Lee, who's uh, also been getting interested in uh, RL, and then uh, and Garab, who's a student at UCSD, and who's really been uh, doing some pretty interesting work in RL. And he's you know he's new to this area, but he's really uh, uh, taking off. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. All right, so now, is, uh, now we have some time for people to ask some additional questions. And uh, you know, if you're up for it, I encourage you to unmute and, and ask your question. You can also type it into the chat and uh, I'll pay attention to that. Um, so rather than let people feel rushed, I'm just gonna be quiet for a few moments and see if uh, people have questions. While people are building up courage, I'm going to ask one. Sean, can you go back a slide? A few more. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this last term here that you were harping on. I mean, I'd be I'd be I'd be uh, I'd like to hear more. You know, I see this as transferring. So the approximation error is is an expectation on one or me one measure, and then you're multiplying by this ratio of worst case ratio of, uh, of densities, right? To a transfer it to be an expectation on another one. So, I mean, so that's worst case, right? It, it's, uh, it would, it, we expect it to be this big if 
somehow the, the, the mass is concentrated exactly where the measures are most different uh, in this microscopic way. So I'm, w I'm wondering if like, you know, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent like you could just have written this down in terms of, of, a, of a quantity that you might not know um, how to compute, but would kind of tell you, oh, okay, you expect to do well provided this thing is nice. So yeah. Good question. This is, this is uh, uh, what we uh, wrote in, in the paper and uh, and for presentation purposes, it's easier to write it with a standard notion of approximation error. So why is this a, a approximation error? So uh, for regression, your approximation errors, you just look at your loss of the best fit thing and it should be zero if there's no approximation error. Okay, and this is approximation error under your current fitting distribution. Forget about the eta t because that's just like your target at time t. Okay, so this is how you're fitting. So this is your approximation error. Okay, but what matters is uh, take the best thing uh, in your class uh, under, you know, under this distribution because the best in class is a function of your fitting distribution. Okay, so take that best in class and see how well you do uh, under where say an optimal policy tends to visit. So it's literally just distribution shift. Take the best in class under one distribution, look at its average error under where say an optimal visits, it doesn't have to be optimal, just something you wanna have higher value to. Okay. And look at that guy's square loss. You'd like it to be small, okay. And if, uh, and, and the point now, this whole term, you could replace it with epsilon transfer. Uh, so you don't need this density ratio. Uh, and, and what it means is, uh, uh, so, so what's nice about this compared to like these um, non-incremental methods is we only need to transfer well uh, with regards to some competitor's policy where it tends to visit. Okay, so it's a fixed distribution where we need transfer learning to work as opposed to something where you want to say, I want to transfer against all possible distributions. Okay, and th this is getting into a longer answer, but suppose for a moment we took like a huge gradient step, like we, um, like we were greedy. Okay, now the concern there is it's a much more nasty transfer learning error because so you suppose like, you know, you fit your cues and I literally did some kind of greedy policy update. Okay, so I'm like driving somewhere. I think at one little spot in the world, I think uh, I got it slightly wrong. Okay, but then I'm gonna take an action uh, at that uh, spot because I, I'm greedy. And maybe I'm gonna veer off course and end up going to like an area of the world I've never visited. Okay, this is a horrible transfer learning notion and uh, like we could have collapse because uh, somehow if you're taking greedy updates, you need to transfer it to like wherever you might end up. Okay, but here, because we're changing the measure slowly, uh, the way the theory works out is we just need to have like controlled transfer learning to a fixed distribution, which is our competitive uh, measure. Uh, but th this is really a, a, a kind of, you know, there's two subtle points here. It's sort of why the incremental notion is good uh, and there's how we think about transfer learning in RL. So, you know, in words, what we really want is features which um, allow us to, uh, you know, we want to do well where our target distribution is like, you know, the imitation learning target distribution. That's basically what we want. Like if we could get demonstrations from an expert, um, like where to visit, this would be great. Then we wouldn't have this concern at all. Uh, just what, let me just add that this issue of uh, domain adaptation guarantees failing when you are not in the realizable case is something that we have it addressed directly when we analyze the domain adaptation. So there's all kind of worst case cases for domain adaptation that we analyze with rules that exactly run into this problem. Once you're not realizable, you're practically your bounce collapse. Yeah, no, I mean, Shai is the person who like, you know, uh, he's really done the work here, uh, trying to understand what's going on. I see, so I see a few questions in the chat. Uh, I see one from Blair. Blair, do you want to turn on your, your, uh, your yeah, mic sure. and ask that? Yeah. 
So uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, earlier on, sorry, I didn't like write down a, a slide where it was, but you had the like regret looking term like V uh, minus V star was depending just on one over T and you like emphasized that there was no dependence on the size of the state space. Yeah. But I think you also said that you'd kind of been able to view it uh, like an expert's problem. So do you have intuition on why uh, like you're able to get something that doesn't have like a log A showing up in that case? Oh uh, yeah, okay, right, right, and this is a cool. Uh... Uh, yeah, this is uh, a bit magical. Um, yeah, so, uh, all right, so the question is like, uh, you know, I'm viewing this like an expert's uh, uh, algorithm and uh, and experts, you often have like log something uh, or other, like log number of experts. And uh, there is a sense in which you might view this as like experts over policies, but there's way too many policies because uh, the number of policies is uh, a to the um, a to the s. So, so that's too big. Log number of policies is bad. But like, why aren't we even getting a log number of actions? Well. Somehow I, I don't have, um, I mean, this is where the magic comes in that uh, we're also getting a one over T rate. And because of that, uh, uh, you can just set the learning rate a little higher and it cancels out that factor. But like, I don't understand like why uh, th this is happening because many people have asked like, is this just some kind of convexity in, di in, dis in disguise? Like, why are we able to get like typically when you get rates like this for non-convex problems, uh, you know, you can look at the analysis and you say, oh, you just re-parameterized it like some uh, way that makes it non-convex. And so this is more of a broader point about uh, the sort of log A that um, why that's going away. So I don't have the intuition, but part of it is, uh, you know, what's going on with this analysis is it feels very close to policy iterations. You somehow with dynamic, pro uh, with, with MDPs, there's two ways to think about solving it in the tabular case. There's the linear programming approach, which clearly is relying on convexity. But then when we look at the iterative methods like value iteration, policy iteration, uh, those are much closer to simplex methods and we get convergence rate for it, but those analyses definitely do not rely on convexity. They rely on these contraction properties uh, and the MDP structure. So, uh, you know, dynamic programming works but dynamic programming is not, uh, there's no good interpretation of dynamic programming through the lens of convexity. And I would say that's kind of what's going on in this analysis, uh, that somehow it's an incremental approach. So it looks like we're doing some interior point, point thing, but we're not tracing out anything like an interior point method. It really feels a lot more like it's a soft version of the policy iteration and uh, uh, yeah, so I don't have anything particularly deep aside from, uh, I feel if I did, I would have a better understanding of policy iteration as a, as the simplex method. Uh, why it's an expert algorithm is because um, the way we did it in this, I mean, in the, in the, the way that earlier paper I mentioned uh, views it as expert algorithm is, I don't know how familiar with RL, but you could, replace this with advantages, it's the same algorithm. And what you're doing for an expert algorithm, it's like, you, it's, it's like you're putting an expert at every state that independently is trying to compete well. Like, you know, the expert wants to choose a good action and it's somehow trying to ignore what everyone else is doing and just try to be like a good expert's algorithm on the Q values that are fed into that expert's algorithm. So somehow you just magically ignore the fact that it's an MDP, pretend like every state is its own expert and you're feeding in uh, its own Q function uh, to it. So it's like, it's somehow like there's no global constraints. You just do this through the loss. So every state, uh, you know, it pretends like I'm at this state and I'm gonna decide which action it takes. Someone else is, I'm at this state, I'm gonna decide which action to do. And we don't force any kind of consistency, but everyone, uh, so everyone runs an expert algorithm because this is just EG at a given, you know, if you fix S, this is an expert's algorithm, right? Uh, because you're literally doing 
you know, exponential and some loss. And somehow uh, the way these advantages work out, uh, when you plug things, in, it, plug things in, it ends up, you end up being able to relate this to your global cost. But at every state, this is clearly an expert's algorithm, the way I've described it. If you fix a state, this is just an expert where you're plugging in the Q pause. Okay, and then you just kind of magically uh, put things together into the global cost, but the actual you know, experts algorithm is like a decoupled experts algorithm for every state. Interesting, cool. Thanks for that, that's a great answer, thanks. Anyone else out there have a question for Sean? Probably take one more question before uh, we hit our usual 15 minutes Q&A. We actually have one question in the chat. Um, oh yes, Wasim Garbier. Yes. Is it sound to apply policy regularization um, uh, to model-based RL? And I guess there's also a sub question is, is somehow policy regularization equivalent to KL regularization earlier in the talk? Um, I might have butchered that question. So I, I can give Wasim. some context. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, earlier in the talk, you were talking about regularizing uh, the policy. I typically deal with uh, model, like if I have to do reinforcement learning, I typically have to deal uh, with it in the model based in a model based sense. Uh, I usually have visu visual inputs. And so uh, I do find myself adopting similar techniques to the regularization method that you have uh, proposed, but uh, I wanted to know your opinion about how sound it theoretically is to um, employ such uh, technique uh, in the model-based setting. Right, okay, so to answer the question, yeah. How do we think about like regularization and, and model-based uh, approaches? So. Uh, and here you're kind of, are, are you simultaneously learning like a model and a policy or? Uh, yes, um, uh, let's, so, so I, I mean, sometimes, yes, it's a model and a policy. Other times I have a pre-trained model and I just need to either fine tune it or just learn the policy, fine tune it and learn the policy or just learn the policy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, depending yeah, okay. on. So, um, okay, there's the, um, Perhaps the less interesting answer uh, I'll do it first, and then maybe the more nuanced. So the less interesting one is, you know, in the space of like model-based learning, if we're ignoring like uh, sort of values and 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 the policy, uh, you know, one regularization is just usual bias uh, variance, and and that like yeah, that's a different reason why we want to do regularization. Like we do regularization, you know, supervised learning as well through early stopping and other uh, for, for other reasons and. While this looks like regularization uh, in, in the policy space, it's actually uh, trying to warp, uh, it, it's trying to actually change the curvature of the problem. So the KL one uh, is regularization, but it's really trying to change the curvature of the problem. And it's kind of a bad way to do it because uh, so the natural gradient is actually just changing the curvature. Uh, explicitly, whereas this one is actually hurting performance, but to try to improve the curvature. Okay, and that's different than the sort of statistical trade off for model complexity. Uh, and, you know, with softmax, uh, like we really should be trying to rescale things like with adaptive gradient methods uh, kind of thing. So, so I'd say the reasons are a bit different, but maybe the more nuanced answer is if we're, if we have a policy in the mix too, uh, it's kind of important to have slow changes in order to make sure the policies are stable, because uh, you know, even if you're doing a model, if you like simultaneously have a, a policy, which is like how you collect your data and you're slowly improving that, uh, then you you know it's it somehow the way the, these things work is we need stability to make sure that policy doesn't change very quickly, uh, and there the regularization for the model like it is you know we actually might want to keep the model stable. Uh, not just for statistical purposes, uh, so we might need that for the policy not to like uh, veer off because like a small change in the model might actually uh, amplify when we go to the policy because maybe the policy will take a left turn somewhere because your model says, oh, this looks about as good, but then it might lead to like a very different data collection distribution, which could lead to all kinds of problems. So, uh, so in the interactive learning setting, 
then yeah, I think there's many reasons for why uh, we want to have stability through regularization, uh, which we don't really have a good handle uh, handle on. This is the more nuanced answer. 